starting. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, what is this now, fourth edition of Are You Live? Today, we are joined by the great, the fabulous, the wonderful Daniel Coffeen. I always want to be like one of those comedians, like the African-American comedians are quite good at this, right? They just, they come out on stage as opposed to like the neurotic Louis C.K. guys. That's right. Make the grand entrance. Yeah. Austin, Christian, man. We're not, not in me. It's not in me. That's right. So, um, Daniel and I will uh, talk for a minute, but, you know, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. I know that people have lots of questions because you were recently on the Unregistered Podcast, and I bet a lot of people have seen that or listened to it. That was a good one. Yeah. It was a great one from your couch in that house that you're sitting in right now. That, by the way, that was recorded before the pandemic, before the lockdown for all of you. Who are comment I got. Before you start shaming us for uh, lack of social distancing. To be honest, I found it most disappointing that people would doubt the depths of my Hebraic hypochondria. Like, <laughs> why would anyone think, anyway? I just, people don't know me at all. <laughs> they don't know the Jews, man. They don't understand the Jews. How are they thinking, yeah. Still a mysterious race to most of us, you know. Even, even us quarter breeds. We don't, we don't quite understand. I don't understand this, this, this thing in me that comes out every, every fourth day. You know, I, get, I start to feel like I'm sick. Every fourth day. You're lucky. I got it all the time. I can't shake it. I, I, I bathe. It doesn't do any good. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we talked about a lot of stuff on the, on the last episode, and I'm sure people had lots of questions, and I have some follow-up questions, too. Um, but let's, um, well, yeah, I wanted to start off with this discussion we had about drugs. And your absolutely outlandish, irresponsible claim that you believe that the hallucinations that you experienced in one of your recent trips in which you saw stra uh, strands of light floating through the air in, yeah. the living room, in the living room that I was sitting in with you, right? That same living room. Uh, different, same rug, different house. Yeah. Oh, different house, whatever. Okay. That you actually, that they were actually real and that- yeah, we were playing with them, <laughs> pulling them apart. Stop, stop, hold on. Yeah, so he, you and a friend like actually saw these things that no other, people would have seen if they had walked in that room, right? Yeah, no, that's, that's what a drug does. It, it, I mean, all that stuff to me is so sort of obvious. I mean, if you were really, really tired, there's things you don't see, right? You're really sleepy, you, things go by, you don't notice them, some's the corner of your eye. I mean, the fact that the things we, we're constantly adjusting the, our, our perceptive modes. I mean, it just seems obvious, depending on all kinds of factors. Food, sleep are the most primary ones, but also our mood. I mean, you're depressed. I mean, I've gone through long stretches of my life depressed. You don't see a whole lot or super filtered. Um, um, and so then there are certain things, um, certain what we call drugs. It's always, I, it's a hard word because I'm not sure quite what it means. Um, but there's, for a drug for me, is a hyper-condensed kind of food. You know, I mean, I always say if I could, if I could make you a salad and you'd eat that salad and for the next four hours feel so fucking great, wouldn't you eat that salad? Yeah, it's called MDMA. Like it's, I don't understand. Like why, why we draw these lines? Like people, yeah, I eat food to feel good. Yeah, me too. Some of my food and my salad is MDMA or DMT or. All right. So this is part of your larger claim that there is this thing that you call affect that operates exists between around us socially and otherwise that cannot be seen can't be measured can't be quantified but needs to be taken account of correct yeah and not only needs to be taken account of I, i'm interested in it being taken account of in a more systematic way um but in fact is we, we do it all the time right we i mean that's how we read people right i look at my kid or my lover or something be like what's wrong Hmm. I mean, we do that all the time. I mean, it, it's part of our knowledge system and our decision making all the freaking time. Hmm. It's just true. It's just been for some reason, you know, getified out of, you know, out of any sort of rigorous thought. And it's because our dominant thinking is so Judeo-Christian. It's so. Oops. Oops, I'm sorry. My Shit. I'm sorry. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Post most of my life. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Say, say the last 20 seconds again, my bad. Um, no, see, it's all, it's all about rhythm here. I know, I'm so sorry. Um, 
uh, I don't know what the fuck I was talking about. Something about affect and flow. You read, you read it between people. You read it with between with yeah, other it's people. It's happening all the time. It's just not ever taking it. I was saying that our knowledge systems that's really dominated by a super anachronistic model of uh, it comes out of the Enlightenment. It's so fucking long ago. So idiotic. Um, that is actually super Judeo-Christian. And I've always been surprised by the, that for some reason, popular discourse has put this struggle between religion and science as if it's so weird to me. That's the greatest conspiracy I know of because they are fundamentally um, disdainful of the body, fundamentally both nihilistic practices that have a disdain for, for the material world. All right, let's back, let's back up though, hold on. Yeah. So let's let's put it in sort of more mundane terms what you're talking about so people can really understand this. So or uh, so you talk about like mood, right? Everyone's familiar with mood and you, you can feel a mood in a conversation you're having with someone which affects your knowledge. That is part of the epistemology of the moment, right? It, it affects how you deal with this person, what you say, how you hear what you say, the decisions you might make as a result of the conversation. Yeah. Right, you, it could be even be life or death decisions based on a mood that you are perceiving in that moment. Right, yes. I think everyone can understand that. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's like on one end of the scale, and then the other end of the scale, you're seeing floating things, you know, that no one else can see. Oh uh, yeah, I mean that's which, just. Which let me throw a word at you, please. Which I have not thrown at you before, and I just want you to just respond to the word paranormal. Think about the think about that word, right? And what do you want to do with that word? Because it sounds, you know, a lot of people would say you're, 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 um, you're dealing in the paranormal now. You're trafficking in paranormal ideas. I, I, I think that's what I'm trying to shift is what counts as the normal, right? I mean, this was always Foucault's argument, of, you know, that what a, a discourse defines, he had a great phrase of what's in the true. Right? So Mendel, when he was, it was Mendel, all of a sudden it sounds so Jewish, Mendel, uh, when he was doing his uh, peas, right, and doing his, genetic engineering of peas, which is now dominates agriculture, uh, he was considered a lunatic, right? Because that notion of genetic predisposition and genetic uh, inheritance was not in the truth, right? So he was insane. He was relegated to the outside, right? And a cult, that's what discourse does. And so for me, I want to just define, redefine what counts as the truth, redefine the limits of a discourse so that things that we, that drive our behavior so often in our decision-making, like affect, um, are, are constitutive of our knowledge claims more generally. Right. As opposed to being paranormal. I want them to be normal. Right. Okay. Um, I think it's time for a question. Ken. All right. So, yeah. Um, oh, God. So much to say. Uh, where to start. Um, so, you know, I, I'm curious, you know, what your... Um, experiences are with various types of psychedelics. Um, you know, I've kind of considered myself a psychonaut as well. Um, some of the most amazing trips I had were, you know, like at Burning Man. And I noticed that I would often, you know, kind of have experiences that correlate with what you're talking about. Um, noticing little things that uh, I never would have noticed before. Um, and this wasn't at Burning Man, but uh, I was tripping on LSD and I, I noticed that like the light bulb in my lamp was like flickering really, really fast. And I never noticed that before. And I just realized like, oh, that light bulb is getting old. It's flickering really fast. And normally it's, it's flickering so fast that you can't even, your eyes don't pick up on it. But um, it's definitely a real thing that's happening. So, um, you know, like you probably know, um, and anyone else who's tried these things, you know that your, your pupils will dilate. So they let in more light. And so you are more uh, susceptible, um, sensitive to, you know, various light sources. And uh, you just notice kind of certain things have kind of a glow to them. Um, not much of a question, but um, you can riff off of that. Yeah, no, I, that's exactly, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's beautiful. I mean, that's exactly the point is it's not so esoteric what I'm saying. You know, I'm, pot is a great example. I think pot is, um, God, I, I always, you know, I've been getting high for so long, you know, I kind of forget about it. And we tend to privilege these other things like, like you know, acid and, and, and DMT because they're so explosive. But God, pot, and we all know this experience. The pot is the best at revealing affective landscapes, right? That's what happens. And people talk about paranoia on pot. It's, uh, that's, that's what it is, is all of a sudden you're reading a room that normally you pass over, right? I, we're so used to a kind of social blindness. Um, you know, I, I, I've never, I will never go to, let's say, uh, uh, 
palm reader or tarot or anything like that because I don't want to know my future. That's between me and my death, you know? Um, but to me, if we, any of us were to sit down in a room and you gave, you paid me money and I was just allowed to look at you and judge and assess you, I would be able to say all kinds of things, right? Same with me, you look at me and be like, dude, you gesticulate a lot, you seem a little nervous, you seem, right? All kinds of things you'd be able to say, but because we're not, it's not part of polite society, it's not part of etiquette, we just don't do it. But all, all that information is coming at us all the time. And certain drugs like pot, um, amplify them or just make them so apparent. It's really just opening up a sense, you know, like sunglasses, temper light, pot opens them up. And like you're saying with things like acid, uh, mushrooms, they dilate your pupils. I mean, things look different. You're getting more information coming in. And then certain kinds of information is coming in super distorted because your pupils are too big. You can't see it. So bright lights, but then you see these other registers of light like the pulsing light bulb or like these little strands and my friend and I were seeing um, and that was a luxurious experience we had because we were I had had that so I had smoked DMT which is you know so explosive and just puts you down but we were smoking changa which I'd never done and which which is a bunch of herbs with DMT in it and we were able to kind of just ride participate in strands of light, we were very lucid, you know, I mean, again, a normal DMT can't really speak, you can't move, um, at least my experience. Um, but with this time, we were just, we were just going for a while. And, you know, I just turned to my friend Michael, I'm like, yeah, you see that? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just, he just pulled it, you know, and we just we pulled apart these little strands of red light. It seems so obvious, you know, there was nothing spectacular about it. It wasn't, seeing demons it wasn't you know and, and I, I i also know my experiences and my knowledge is limited because i haven't had that happen you know i haven't seen the, the the horses of the apocalypse come storming down the street you know um but i would still say that you're tapping into an affective semiotic symbiosis that sort of pervades the atmosphere and so that your your local semiotic economy inflects the affective economy and maybe you see it as a as the horse of the apocalypse as opposed to the devil as opposed to something completely non-western you know um let me, let me uh, come back at you again so i believe is this right everyone i believe a majority of americans believe in the existence of the angels and ghosts it's some uh, it's right. not it's some large percentage someone someone fact check that but it's some some very large percentage right Landry's on it. Um, is, so what would you say to those claims that there are angels and ghosts? By the I don't know what a fucking angel is, but ghosts? I mean, I deal with ghosts all the time, don't we all? I don't understand. Like that's, that's one of the weirder ones to me. Um, I yeah. mean, I, what do you mean? Really? Like I, I, ghosts, ghosts are, 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 the, are disembodied remnants of, of things that are, I mean, Fuck, we all know dead people, but even people we don't know are dead. I walk in a room and particularly with, with ones I've been more intimate with, um, it just seems to me that ghosts are not, I mean, fuck, I mean, this is just my weird shit, but about death, like when I die, I don't stay my ego, but my, my shape in the world, right? Everything, every pebble inflects the universe just so necessarily, right? If it's all this plenum and everything's connected and flowing, right? It's the butterfly effect, right? It, it, it's it's uh, chaos theory, right? But that's just a necessary condition of life. So that means every living being inflects everything else. And when that being goes, the reverberations of that being still exist. So that being still exists, even if not embodied um, through sort of affective or invisible flows. I think affect is too reductive. I think there's more things out there. So you have that with ghosts all the time, um, sometimes very intensely, sometimes more casually. I, I, I don't know how you don't. I don't, I don't know what it would mean to not believe in ghosts. <laughs> Serious, I don't know what it means. What does it mean to say there's no ghosts? What, I, don't, what, I don't know what that means. Angels, fuck, that's just a semiotic weirdness. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? You don't know or you, do, you not, do you dispute? So the Americans who report this, who believe, you know, you're, 
you're saying they're not wrong. I'm not saying they're wrong. Yeah, and the angel thing, I don't, I, I don't know what an angel is. I'm not versed at all in angels. Christian weirdness, but oh, you're Jews don't do angels, so I don't know. Um, no Jew angels? Jews don't believe in angels? No, no, no. We just have guilt. You know that haunts us enough. Like we don't. So there's no, there are no positive Oedipus, Oedipus and guilt. You know, <laughs> positive spirits in the Jewish mind is what. Yeah, you're saying. yeah. This I was saying. Yeah, it's just, it's just a hellstorm of. Um, uh, Chris Landry, Nicole, and a couple other people, I think Ken report, did the research for us. Are you in, in action here? 45% of Americans uh, believe that, according to polls, believe in angels, demons, or other spirits. What about demons? Well, you believe certainly in that, right? Well, I, again, I don't know what it means. That that's just seems to me a kind of... Um, well, a, a semiotic articulation of forces that are there, right? So uh, demons, yeah, demons, I don't know what that means. I, so practically speaking, literally, I don't know what those words mean. Break down. If you haven't, please mute. If you haven't muted. Please mute, Justin. Because we're getting the feedback. <laughs> semiotic, what was this? Semiotic what of what? what kind of so you learn a certain, you learn a certain, uh, like local semiotic economy, right? So you go to church and they start imbuing you with shit like God and devil and hell. I, I don't know much about that. So I just know from TV, I don't, I don't you know. I just know, you know, we were kids and uh, my parents took us to some, we were living in Manhattan into, I don't even remember what cathedral, right? And there's, you know, a skinny Jew nailed to a cross with blood coming out of him. You know, and just being, I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't know what's going on here. And my my, you know, father who abandoned me soon thereafter was like, yeah, don't worry about it. That's not us. And just being like, all right, I got to get the hell out of here. But I, people are living through that, have all kinds of participants mean in a, in a circulation of meaning. And that circulation of meaning takes, you know, is in my semiotic economy doesn't have those figures in it. I don't know what they mean. Okay. Does that make sense? Semiotic economy, can you tell us what that means? A, a set of symbols, a, 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 the way of something might mean something. So you pick up on um, a mood in a room, I can, you can be like, you can ignore it. You can say, oh, that's X, that's, I can do my whole language. I'm coming from Deleuze and Guattari and my own weird burrows and psychedelic experiences and be like, oh, that's just the flow of affect, man. That's cosmic forces. And someone else is like, no, that's, you know, that's the devil, that's a demon, that's an angel. Um, and it's not that they're the same thing, it's that that force is now shaped by that, that imbuing of a certain value, a certain semiotic value, a certain significance. Okay, so my father subscribed to the Skeptical Inquirer. You know about this magazine? I love the title. Skeptical Inquirer, I don't know if it's still around, but basically all it did was debunk all the paranormal claims, all the UFO claims, all the Bigfoot claims, all the angels and ghosts claims. So, and then, you know, I, then I went straight into the academy and we don't think these ways. We think that's all for the ordinary dumb Americans believe that stupid shit. Here comes Mr. PhD from the fanciest, uh, probably the fanciest, most cutting edge academic department in the country. UC Berkeley's rhetoric department, Daniel Coffin, PhD from there. And you're telling us this shit's real. Well, some of it, I, I, you conflated a lot of things in there. I mean, UFOs and all that kind of thing. I mean, um, What's, why not UFOs? Uh, well, it's a different kind of claim. So it, just to say those things are the same, I'm just saying that there are all kinds of forces amongst us that we live in all the time. That's said, we live within an historical landscape. We all know this. We look up at the stars. This is a famous thing. I'm not saying anything physics, physicists don't tell us. I'm looking up at the stars. Those things are millions, billions of years old. It's a fucking ghost, right? We live in weird historical landscapes all the time, all kinds of temporal faults. That's just what we do daily. It's not, it's not so weird to say. Sometimes I can call those things a ghost. I can say that's just old light. If that makes you happy. I don't care. Um, How about this? Let me try this. Is this... Is this something that you would say? Um, something, sometimes we have a memory or we start to think about someone who's dead. And it so colors our feelings and even the way we see 
and even the way we hear and smell. And I think this is something that all of us probably have shared, right, in that moment, right? Uh, many times, probably, right? Um, that could be, but, but you don't see your sister walking through the room in front of you. I don't see my grandmother, but nonetheless, they are present. And here's another word, for me in that moment, as real as this table. Exactly, exactly, yeah. That's that's, okay. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a that's almost it's almost banal, right? It's it's so familiar, it's so quotidian that I don't, you know, that it's I, I don't know. That's part of an argumentative move I like to make, which is just it, you think it sounds extraordinary. It's not. But then you start talking about UFOs, and then we have to get into definitions of intelligence. And I mean, we're already aliens. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand. Like we're made up of the cosmos. Like we're I don't understand that. <laughs> Uh, so, all right, let me get personal here. Um, so my girlfriend, Danny, who's now a, a star of unregistered media, um, she has told me that at least as a child and maybe after, that she was psychic. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why not? Yeah, cause, because I'm saying it's a knowledge. My whole point is there's a knowledge that's there. And so you can lean into it or not. So I talked to my son about it because he and I both had these experiences for a long time and I didn't talk about them much until he started having things happen. Um, but because of these temporal folds, if you just picture an event as a whole flow, before it happens, it's already happening, right? I mean, that's obvious. I mean, part of this is, if, quick lesson in rhetoric, uh, you know, metonymy, we talk about metaphor and metonymy. Um, metaphor is when you compare two really different things, right? So in films, uh, you know, someone's about to get stabbed and all of a sudden it cuts to a lightning bolt. That's a metaphor for the death. Metonymy is when someone's about to get stabbed and then all of a sudden it cuts and you just see blood dripping down away from the body or you see their toe, right? It happens a lot in sex scenes, right? You don't, the sex scene could be it's raining outside or sex scene could be they wake up in the morning and you see their feet, right? It's a metonymy, it's continuous with the whole. Mm -hmm. I see the world as fundamentally sort of um, metonymic. Everything's sort of connected and, and, and bleeds into everything else, right? So if that's the case, we're in these flows. So the, the anticipation of something, it's not that you're seeing the future, it's that the future is already happening, right? Again, it's not so esoteric. It's not like I'm looking out into the future. Well, I, okay. right? so I, I believe in, I don't know much about astrology or tea leaves or tarot, but I, I like the idea of them because you're continuous, right? So I could, it seems very inefficient to me, but I could say, because you are tied up in all these different planetary, you're continuous, you're a part of a universe that involves moons and suns and galaxies, all the shit moving around, but I could study all of them to make a claim about you. It seems phenomenally inefficient. Like, why not just look at me? And to me, like a real astrology would go, could go both directions. Just look at me and tell me about the stars, but because it's all connected, it's all metonymic. Um, I've been watching, just watching Breaking Bad with my kid, which I've seen before. That show loves metonymy, right? Yeah. Just watch how they film everything. Everything's about with the continuous flow of events that spiral out, they shoot from these angles that are continuous. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think at some point, how can you not be, if you lean into that knowledge? Hmm. Okay. You know? for the taking we just generally are taught not to partake of it right does that make sense like, yeah again, i don't think it's an extraordinary claim i'm making it seems sort of banal <laughs> except that virtually everyone in the universities would disagree with you yeah but fuck them i mean <laughs> you know i mean it's, i think we all kind of know these things you walk in you're like i got a bad feeling my my kid's first week of school uh last his freshman year public high school here in San Francisco, there was a, there was a kid brought a gun to the school and shooting it in the classroom. Oh. And um, he, 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 was, he was so adamant about it. He still is like, Dad, I knew, I knew, I knew what was gonna happen that day. And I, I, I don't doubt it, you know? I can sh I'll share a ridiculous, I mean, a silly thing. I'd, I've only now been talking about last few years, which is, you know, my good friend when I was in fifth grade, my best friend down the street, I dreamt his father's death the night before it happened, down to, the, down to almost the detail, right? Um, and it was, I can see it right now, it was obvious. And at the time I was like, well, this is weird. I, I never mentioned it. 
But again, now that I'm older, it just seems sort of obvious. Like we're in flows that are temporally complex, right? Because they're contiguous. They're metonymic. Hmm. If that makes sense. Okay. So back to drugs and your hallucinations. <laughs> are you, you are making the claim, what? That those strands of light floating through the air act, existed outside of your consciousness and the consciousness of your friend? Oh. Yeah, of course. Yeah, what do you mean outside my consciousness? Everything's outside my consciousness. I don't believe in that interior, exterior juxtaposition. We're all already turned inside out. You know, we, we're phenomenological beings. We are turned inside out. You know, so there is, the strands of light are there for us to see. Yes, just like Ken was saying, right? I mean, I, I, I share his take on this, which is your pupils are dilated. It didn't seem that big a deal. It was just, it was very pedestrian. So how do I... How do I see those strands of light? Um, you smoke DMT. And you're one thing that's interesting about psychedelics is there's not just one. Each one is different. It's not like each one is a different path. Thing. Each one opens up different things. DMT is so peculiarly ge geometric. Um, and I, 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 on, my, on my 50th birthday, I went up to Stinson Beach and I rented a cabin on my own. And for the first time, I saw DMT alone out on the beach at, at night and kept my eyes open, which I get, I'm relatively inexperienced with DMT. So I was making my 10th time or something. And I, I could see the geometry of the waves in the sky, right? Which is so different, let's say, than mushrooms, which are much goobier, right? They reveal, they're tapped into different flows, different architectures of, um, of the universe, you know? And for some reason, DMT is weirdly geometric. And I think that's one reason it's really popular is, is uh, burners and that shit, they love geometry. They, that whole sacred geometry, they always confuse me because I'm much more interested in the calculus of geometry. But, um, you know, it's, it, there are these fractals and, you know, symmetries and things which don't exist with mushrooms or acid. So each, each, uh, each particular drug is a channel? Yeah. Well, I, if I eat a hamburger and I eat, a, I eat um, sushi, I feel different afterwards, right? They're different things. They're both food, but I feel pretty different afterwards, right? I mean, it seems obvious. Well, same. If I eat DMT or I eat MDMA or I eat LSD, I feel different. I mean, it's a different thing, right? Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, it seems sort of obvious to me. Like, they're not all paths to the same. We're all trying to get to the same spot. There's a lot of information out there and there are different access points to this information. We have a culture that likes to suppress more or less rigorously certain kinds of information for various reasons. You know, Terrence McKenna, of course, talks a lot about this. Um, there's a reason that a, a, a predatory or dominant culture, dominant culture wants to suppress certain kinds of information. I, I don't, the ideology interests me and doesn't interest me. To me, I just like this information for my own edification. Hmm. So this is where you are most more you're you're pushing my postmodernist envelope a bit here. You know, this is this Tell is what coming yeah. out. It's good. I want to know what other people are thinking. Are other people understanding this theory he has? This way of thinking? It's not even a theory, it's kind of just a way of thinking. It seems so obvious to me, but I'm curious if it just sounds wacky or it sounds I'll be honest that I, my goal is to make it sound very obvious. It's just like there's nothing really to argue with. It's just hey, we're, but we're, we're both curious. There's votes coming in in the chat. We've got two no's, uh, one skeptical. Um, Nicole wants to know the specific reason for what. Mm, wait, wait, I just I was just reading something great here. Uh, what was that? Talking about organizing. I agree that drugs are not the only way. That's absolutely true. Um, okay. There's all kinds of ways. Meditation, um, uh, extreme experiences of any sort, any disruption of habit. I think this, one thing that's kind of exciting to me about, uh, you know, the collapse of global capitalism and the pandemic is this disruption of the everyday, which is the invitation to see things differently, to begin to understand things differently. I, I understood for the first time the power of the power of a monopoly on money works, for instance. It never occurred to me really before in any profound way. I really got to see literally how it's happening with these disruptions. And I, there's some teachers down in public school in Orange County it's a great teacher down there who, this is his whole mode. He's like, what, rather than trying to teach the syllabus still, the state sponsored syllabus, he's trying to teach the students, um, what do you notice? What kinds of new things are you noticing that you didn't notice before? 
what kind of new information? It could be the rain. It could be the way your parents interact with you. It could be how you wake up and think about the day. Yeah, so I mean, my postmodernism allows me to, to say yes to that, that after I meditate, I really do see and feel the world differently and it changes everything for me. Yeah. Um, and for me, that's just as real for me as anything else. So that I get. It's, this, it's when you get into claims about things that are out, being outside of me, um, you know, I do, I do, I think I am with the interior exterior model. There is a consciousness and there's, and I will, I believe that's all there is, is there's consciousness, right? That, that, that consciousness though is, is, and we have this conversation in a podcast once about empathy. Right. And I don't, I don't believe in that. You have a very enlightened view, enlightenment view of consciousness, not a postmodern view, right? Yeah, it's, not, it's not ecological. Let's talk, okay. Let's talk about, let's talk about empathy. Good. Great. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't, I'm skeptical of empathy, the concept. I'm not sure that it's possible. So this is where, you know, my girlfriend, Danny and I, you know, have a disagreement because she thinks she's so, and, and she really, it's funny. She is, she seems to me to be like the most empathic or empathetic person I've ever known. Like she anticipates my thoughts often, it seems. Um, she finishes my sentences and we haven't even known each other for three months. I know, but love. it's- Love, that's love, baby. Well, like it. yeah. But like, even like a, the first week we were together, like she was doing, it was kind of scaring me almost, you know? And then she told me she was a psychic when she was a girl. So, um, woman. I see. No, no, when she was a girl, when she was- I know, but I like this woman, I don't want to have that. Yeah. Um, I lost my train of thought. You blew me. All right, talking about liking a woman. Um, so, I mean, yeah. uh, oh, empathy, yes. Yeah. So I'm skeptical. I'm, I'm skeptical. Here's, here's the- it came up in that podcast and it came up again and I tried addressing it in my own recent video cast where I tried to address it. And for me, again, empathy is not the, um, the, you know, metaphoric, it's metonymic. Okay. It's not that I need to go from me as one thing to you as a completely different thing. Again, that's what metaphor is. Metaphor says your eyes are like the moon, right? It's taking two things that seem discrepant and bring them together. I'm arguing that it's metonymic. The being is, is, is both metonymic and ecological. So we are participating in, in, in a common, in my thing, I stumbled on a great word. I was very happy about this. I'm talking about affect a lot. And as I was just riffing in this live thing I was doing, I came out with this idea of plasma, that affect functions as a plasma layer um, that, that functions as a kind of communicative layer. So here, the example, for me, is uh, the most obvious one is you look at a dog or cat and you're like, oh, you know if they're sad or happy. How do you know that? You didn't ask them. You don't share a language, right? But there's something you know. There's a communication. And communication, I always see, you know, as vibratory, right? It's, it's not just this metaphoric jump across discrepant things. But if everything's metonymic and flowing between bodies, right, and you and I, we're both made of the same stuff we're taking in stuff according to different styles but we take in air and and um you know uh, food and blood and you know vision and you know i was gonna say booze but that's not the best example but we take in this life you know in different ways but we're, it's still we're taking from life and we're playing it back we're these metabolic machines okay right? And so an affect is one of this sort of layer of plasma that I consider a kind of communicative layer. So the way a, a dog will look at you and you know, you know the way that dog feels without knowledge, without words, without semantics, without straight up semiotic system, right? It's a vibratory thing. Same thing happens between us. We are just of an affective flow. I don't feel as you feel, okay. but just like if we're on a blanket, right? and I pull the blanket a little bit. We both feel it differently, but there's a common, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not, does that make sense? Yes, I don't like it. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Yeah, please. People, people, and by the way, I see your hands raised now. Um, there was a, a technical thing, and now I see your hands raised, everybody. I will get to you in a second with questions. Um, you, does everyone listening understand what the political danger is here? It's imperialism. How? 
Because you're making claims about what other people need, uh, uh, want. No, it's misreading what I'm saying. It's not a one-to-one. It's, it's that we are, we are fundamentally ecological beings. So I know you and your renegade shtick really want to privilege a very particular idea of a kind of enlightenment self, which is removed and isolated and cool. And I'm saying, no, identity is fundamentally ecological. We, we, we participate and our identities are formed as part of a, a collective formation that is both cultural, historical, uh, physical, cosmic, all the shit all happening at once. And because we're, we're, we all participate in the same kind of general cosmic ooze, cosmic shtick, cosmic plasma, cosmic gunk, cultural gunk, we, we nudge each other, we nudge, right? I mean, I, a lot of my stuff's come from Leibniz. You know, I'm a big fan of Leibniz. If anyone gives a shit, uh, even if you've never read philosophy, go online, find uh, Leibniz's monadology. It's online. It's 90 propositions. It's about six pages. It's at the end of his life, he lays out the entire universe from the first proposition that there are symbols to the final proposition that this infinite harmony of everything. But he, he suggests that life, he argues that life is a planet. It's full. There's no, there's no empty space between us. If that's true, then the nudge of one body, just as the butterfly flaps its wings and it rains here, right? Uh, when you feel sad, Thad, I don't necessarily feel sad as you feel sad, but I feel your sadness in some way, in a metonymic way, necessarily, just empirically. Maybe. It's not one-to-one. I, it's not that I can speak for you. It's that I can speak with you. That was a great distinction for Co always made about the prisons, you know? I don't speak for prisoners, I speak with prisoners. I'm, I'm still scared of you on this one, but it's okay. Okay, next question or comment is coming from Australia. Ben and Monique, go for it. Unmute and let it go. Uh, what's my question? So this was back to the topic of the existence of, of ghosts and spirits. And I think, uh, I guess I agree with both of you, and maybe this example will illustrate that, that ghosts and spirits in the kind of cliched fairy tale sense that they're written down in the Bible or whatever else, there's, there's you know, their stories. Uh, but I think these forces are almost um, unarguable. And an example uh, from my clinical practice, um, for those who don't know, I'm a, a psychoanalyst and a 10 year old kid was referred to me. Uh, he's the son of, uh, to a lesbian couple and there was behavioural disturbance at school. He was a very precocious kid, but couldn't follow the rules. Um, and I think it was only in the second session, I asked him about his father. And I asked him about it in a very particular way, because only in the weeks prior, my own father had passed away in very complicated circumstances. And so knowing one's father was a very prominent thing in, in, in my own experience. And this cocky, precocious 10-year-old, at that moment when I asked him about his father, his whole demeanor just dropped and he started weeping. And they came back two weeks later and this boy who'd never spoken to his father before was at home. And for the first time in his 10 years, his father who travels all around the world, the biological father, um, rang and spoke to one of his mothers and asked to talk to him. And that was the first conversation they ever had. And I think that there's no way that chain of events didn't have some sort of cosmic mystical explanation in part. It was just too profound for it to be a coincidence. And if that was the only type of experience like that, you'd say, well, you know, these things happen, but there was just too much about the energy from my personal experience, the way I listened, the way something happened and this boy's father rang him. That is just an example, I think of, of, of how there are all these ghosts zooming about that we can, you know, we don't understand how the hell gravity works, but we know a rock is going to drop on your foot. So we work with what we know of these forces. Okay. I'm interested in your thoughts on that yeah. example. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, I like the way you said it too. I mean, it's just, I mean, I think that's a common kind of thing um, where it's hap it happens. I mean, I, we've all had this experience happen with some frequency, sort of like, the one you just told, maybe in a more banal say, sense where you're thinking of some old friend you haven't seen in a long time and they call you the next day, right? I mean, that, that happens all the time, I, I, you know, and you can, you can, 
the instinct to say, well, that's just a coincidence, but what does that even mean? I mean, a coincidence is the co-timing of something. What's more profound than that? And so it's not magical. It doesn't need to be semiotically significant, but it happened. It's not that that's necessarily more or less profound than any other situation. My point is it's simply a layer of knowledge and data and that if we lean into it, we get a very different kind of science. We get a different kind of epistemology, right? Imagine if you, in your practice, your clinical practice started thinking about those things, right? And, and leaning into the, the sensations you were getting from your own experience, from feeling out somebody else, and then asking those questions, as opposed to sticking to the formula and being like, no, I have to ask them, do they want to fuck their mother? You know, going through the particular preordained pattern does that make sense? I mean, I think that's all I'm saying is it's an information that's there. It's not necessarily more or less meaningful. It could just, but it exists as a layer of communication. Hey, Ben, what would most psychoanalysts say about this? That's a great question. Hmm. What aspect in particular? Like, how would, how would most psychoanalysts, how, how would most of your colleagues respond to what you just said and what Daniel's saying in response to it? Hmm. You're, you're, make, you're making some claims there. Yeah, look, it's, it's, so it's very hard to generalize, of course. I think the, there are profound differences between the different schools of psychoanalysis. Um, and many of them are, are, are mutually incompatible with each other. The group that I'm part of is called the Freudian School of, of Melbourne. And I'm, I'm sort of about five or eight years into my, my training with them. And I, I guess... Um, those colleagues would not be at all surprised by that example. They would, um, you know, the more experienced and learned among them would be able to um, offer more of a, a richer, I suppose, psychoanalytic theoretical account of how that, that might take place. Um, I think they don't go too far in pretending to be able to, to actually explain these things on any sort of, you know, metaphysical level because so much of how we operate is uh, is actually at the level of the unconscious, and all of those kind of forces are uh, are sort of largely speculative, even even amongst the most um, learned and developed psychoanalysts, because of by by definition, so much of it is ungraspable. We can we can get a glimpse of the unconscious in creation through slips and jokes and dreams, for example, but beyond that, it's you know it's all theorization, right. even. As you, as I, and you know, my mother uh, was trained psychoanalytically. She's not technically a psychoanalyst, but she's a psychoanalytic therapist. And she once said to me, show me the unconscious. You can't see it. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you certainly can't measure it or quantify it. No. Right? So, I mean, psychoanalysts of all people should be sympathetic to this concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really great. Yeah, cool. I, think I, I always picture the unconscious as just, I'm not sure I believe in it, that architecture of of identity, but it is a layer that they're tapping into, or Freud is tapping into, is a, again, another communicative layer, a layer of knowledge, a layer of information, a layer of experience. It's happening somehow, you know. So, um, so I got to keep talking about yeah, please. girlfriends. So that's all, what it's all about. So I have an ex um, and I hated her mother. And this this might have colored, I'm sure it did hang, uh, color my, uh, my, reception to this she worked in mental hospitals with schizophrenics and she told me that she said what doctors don't understand is that the voices that the schizophrenics are hearing in their heads are real they're from they're real people inside their you know that they're talking to and i thought that was proof positive that this woman was an idiot and that my hatred of her was justified uh but now i'm thinking you know, I wasn't, being, I wasn't being a good modernist, right? Because, and this is very Foucauldian too, right? Foucault, this was Foucault's, this is how his career started, analyzing the mental, the asylum and making claims that what goes on in the asylum historically has been any aberrant different set of ideas, including what schizophrenics might express, uh, have just been categorized as wrong, as dissident, as needing to be suppressed and thrown away and put into cages and put into asylums, right? 
And I, and, and it's right. I mean, I, I should be embracing what you guys are saying in general terms, like that the real is, is a problematic concept, problematic category in itself. Right. And the real, the real for the schizophrenic hearing voices is just as real as you and me and talking across your couch. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems to me, I'm sorry, I don't know how I turn this off. Why? Some of these apps are better at overriding certain things. Um, yeah, I get it. I think it's really kind of, again, I don't think I'm making that dramatic a claim. And, and so I don't want to juxtapose the mystical with the scientific. I think they're just these different fields of knowledge. And I, there have been times not that long ago, pre-enlightenment, in which, you know, uh, you know, the shaman is, you know, is a famous example, right? Of the person who's at once the doctor, the scientist, um, and the mystic. They don't distinguish these things. Right, all the er early philosophers and scientists and poets, they were the same thing. Lucretius is one of the great poets. He's also a philosopher, he's also a scientist. They didn't make these distinctions. They didn't, you know, I mean, that's a weird, you know, combination of the Enlightenment and capitalism to sort of that's isolate my, these. That's one of my favorite one of your points, that historically, pre-Enlightenment, this yeah. distinctions were not made. These separations were not made. That's, that's a fabulous point. All right, Tom, you've been waiting. What's your question? Got to unmute first. There you go. Actually, I haven't been waiting that long, but I'll ask my question anyway. Uh, Daniel said really early on something like science, like something else, was not concerned with the material world. Mm. And that sounds like your methodology where you say something outlandish and you go explain it. Yeah. Did you explain it? Yeah. Yeah. So here's my point about science is that it's a funny <laughs> enlightenment version of knowledge, right? So there's this back in the Enlightenment, you know, back in the whatever, 17th century, there's this battle between Hobbes and Boyle about the possibility of a vacuum. And, and, and Hobbes, you know, I don't necessarily always ascribe to him philosophically, uh, politically, but philosophically he argued there's no such thing as a vacuum. He was a, what's called a plenist, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a plenist, meaning the world is full. There's no nothing between us. Um, so science began going down this strange route where they thought they could get at truth by eliminating a lot of factors, including the very factors of existence itself. So science, so the laboratory is considered the space where they try to eliminate all the conditions of life. Right? Yeah. I think how weird. They want to get rid of the subject in general. Yeah, but you are the subject and they want to get rid of life itself. They want to get rid of the conditions, gravity, light, all the factors. If we just understand this thing outside of everything else, then I'll know. And sometimes I get it. Sometimes that's an effective methodology, but it's a weird instinct, right? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me I'm looking for a knowledge that's part of life as opposed, as opposed to a knowledge that's premised on life's not happening. I mean, that's talking about nihilism. And so, my argument about science is that they um, position themselves as materialists and yet they ignore so much of material experience because it's invisible. doesn't mean it's not, not material, right? It's the, to me, the great lesson of the mid-century French phenomenologists, right, is that the invisible experience is, um, is still a material experience. Merleau-Ponty if anyone gives a shit, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, great. I highly recommend reading him if you have any. Very readable. Um, it's super fun to read. Don't read his Phenomenology of Perception because it's super philosophical, but he read his essays. Um, but he, he, he says vision is, is a palpation. It's, to me, that was one of the most radical things that, I, that changed my life, right? So, so that to see something is to touch that thing and be touched by that thing. He doesn't separate out touch and vision as radically discrepant experiences, which we do, right? We, we think that somehow if I see something, I'm going to remove from it and I'm not really touching it. And we know from, from Heisenberg, from the presence of the subject, that it changes the very conditions of the experience. But even more, more profoundly, you're changed as the subject. So that to see something is to touch it and have it touch you. Uh, and so it shifts the, again, it shifts the entire epistemological and ontological framework. So science, science shares with uh, the Judeo-Christianity from which it was born um, a disdain for the things of this world, right? So they are like, you know, I'm going to get at the truth. And this is a, Nietzsche makes this claim and he says, well, they're both interested in truth. Um, 
And that's clear, right? They're both going after one thing, where if you were a real materialist or real empiricist, you'd be going after, there would be no thing there. It'd always be multiple, right? The rhizome from Deleuze and Guattari would be the conditions of all knowledge. There'd never be one thing you're getting at, but it'd always be a multiplicity. How could it not be? Um, so to me, they, they, it, it's a little reductive to say they're not materialists, but they are not empirical. Science is distinctly, as a methodology, against empiricism, right? So that they have to ignore so much of the information, so much of the experience itself that is happening empirically to them. And be like, no, I don't care about the mood of this room, right? Um, and I, I, mean, look, I can measure the numbers. Can I change tack just a little bit for a second? You talk about... Uh, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, what, did, what did you call it? Effective... Uh, uh, and uh, well, anyway, effective. Yeah. And when you when you say, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about something you can't see, you can't see a cause. That's a well, you can see any universal. That's not, uh, that's not, yeah. But you still have to deal with them. And the things you're saying sound to me a lot like Spinoza, but mm -hmm. I've never heard you talk about Spinoza. Yeah, Spinoza. The same with Nietzsche. I, does Nietzsche ever talk about Spinoza? Wait, Nietzsche does. Time out. Time out. I just want everyone to make sure they heard what Tom just said. That was so good. You can't, <laughs> yeah. you can't Don't ask me to say it again. I claim to have been in the rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good claim, yeah. That was a good, really good rhythm. You said you can't see a cause. Right. Well, that's what Hume said. Yeah, that's great. That's fucking okay. beautiful. And in fact, you know, a lot of this kind of epistemology I'm talking about begins to move past cause and effect, right? And it's begins moving into the phenomenology of a nexus of things. And so cause and effect is always temporally linear. Um, but the actual construction or architecture of any event, of any knowledge base, need not be linear, right? The future could have, I mean, we just know this, right? If I'm already thinking about the future, it shapes how I'm going in the world. I mean, anyone who's dabbled in this much Buddhism knows that if you, you know, you're planning on something and think it's going to happen, it changes your moment now, right? You get disappointed, you, right? So, um, Spinoza. So Spinoza, yeah, Spinoza, I, I mean, my relationship with Spinoza really practically is I found him very, very difficult to read. And Deleuze calls himself fundamentally a Spinozist and uh, he says Spinoza is the prince of philosophers. But I, perp I read his first book on Spinoza, but not his real huge book on it for a reason, because he, has a really strong influence on me and I don't want to, I want to have my own experience with Spinoza. Um, but yeah, I, Spinoza is that guy who's going to loom for me. Um, and I think it's going to be like a coming home when it happens. Hmm. He's difficult just practically to read the architecture of the page is so bizarre. If you look at it, he has these propositions and proofs and examples and they're so, I don't even know how to read it, which I love. It's, it's a lot like avant-garde literature, you know, which I love, but it's, it's a commitment. It's not my cup. Yeah. Spinoza is like Shakespeare. I like to read about him, not read him. Right. <laughs> so I've been reading, I've been reading, well, I've been working through Deloitte's index of his terminology. That's why this is resonating. I'll say just as a quick aside, if anyone's interested in, and hasn't really read a lot of Deleuze, his first book on Spinoza when he was younger called Practical Philosophy um, is super readable, super just lucid, clear, but the, le the last chapter of it um, has one of the more, uh, one of the arguments that changed my life more than anything else, where he distinguishes between ethics and morality, um, which again is a distinction that shaped so much of my, my thinking, um, where morality is, morality is a universal that speaks across all circumstances, and ethics is the emergent relationship between bodies, um, and <laughs> in that book his first book it's called practical philosophy there's another one called expressionism and philosophy i purposely have not read um because i he shapes so much of how i read leibniz and it's <laughs> you know i i, I want to come to things on my own a little bit this is very persuasive very good reader of things cool we have a couple people who've had their hands up for a very long time so joseph neal go for it yeah uh my question kind of had something you have to clarify something for me first before I can ask the question honestly. Oh yeah. Okay. Did you make fun of Christians 
earlier going whatever crazy ideas or beliefs Christians have? Oh, that's just, that's yeah. just my, that's just my, uh, everyone's got crazy beliefs. I, I, I include myself in the thing. So it's not, a, it's not a judgment. It's they're, they're yeah. nutty. I'm nutty. Everyone's nutty. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's why I was asking. I'm not a Christian, you know, whatever. I, it, it was just, it was, Christian bashing, uh, I grew up Catholic, has become very uh, fashionable anymore. Oh, my, that and, was and not me. I was just I'm like, every, every week we Christians just, and then went on about ghosts and devils. So, yeah, no. That, that's why I wanted to to ask that question first before I, I went in on it. Anyway. I thought you were about to say that Christians are dumb and dumber. <laughs> <laughs> Some are, some are pretty intelligent. I mean, I, I, I don't want to bash Christians. I don't want to bash AEC, atheists or both modernists. Um, I, it, it just, it, I guess I don't really have a question because I didn't, I, I misread what you were saying. So. Uh, that's fair, yeah, no, that's fair. I, I was just saying, as a Jew growing up, Christians were nutty. I was making a joke that for me, I don't, I, I didn't grow up with it. So it's all nutty. Just as I started talking about last night, my family, um, my, my family who I'm deeply alienated from tried doing like a virtual Seder. We didn't even have fucking Seders growing up. I don't know why we got to do one now. And I jumped on for a brief moment and uh, I did get to give my shtick, my nutty shtick about Moses, which is my favorite shtick. Um, and my only thing I really know about, <laughs> about the Old Testament. But it's nutty. You want to hear a quick, quick shtick on this yeah. Passover? So uh, Moses is, is, is a super interesting time uh, in, in the history of God, in the history of the Jews, because up until Moses, God is dealing one-on-one -on -one with dudes he really digs, right? He, like, he really likes Abraham. I mean, fucking A. I mean, he's like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the God of all your kids. I mean, that's... He's not like, you already have a lot of kids. You don't have any kids. And in fact, your wife, you're a hundred years old and you haven't had a kid, but I'm going to give you a kid because I'm good. I like you so much. And it gets super interesting, right? Cause God, God comes to Abraham at one great moment and says, yeah, I'm going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Everyone know the story, right? And Abraham's like, yeah, really? That doesn't seem like such a, that seems a little harsh. And he's, it's a great exchange. He's like, what if there are a hundred people there? who are good people. What if they're 10 people? What if they're one person? He loves these one-on-ones. When he gets to Moses, he's all of a sudden got to deal with the group. So he comes to Moses in the burning bush and he says, Moses, dude, you got to come. You got to help me out. You got to free, 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 free your brethren, the, the Hebrews. And you know what Moses says? We always, sometimes when we skip over this, Moses says, no. I was like, really? I, I don't know. Sounds like a, he's like a Jew. He's like, I don't want to deal with that shit. And God's like, what the fuck? Like, dude, I'm God. I'm God. Like, go take care of shit. So Moses sets out on the road uh, with his son and his wife. And uh, God, it's in the Old Testament. I'm not making this up. It's one line. He says, God tries to kill Moses. His wife, for some reason, this is how nutty the Jews are, talking about crazy people, uh, takes their son takes a rock and circumcises him there right on the spot. It's one of the three examples of circumcision in the Old Testament. Uh, it's like, let my son, let my husband live because I just cut off the foreskin of my son's dick. I mean, talk about wacky shit. Then Moses gets there and he's everybody, let's say, and they're chugging through the uh, uh, Sinai. Have you ever seen on a map how far the how big the Sinai Peninsula is? It's big. It ain't that big. Do you know how long it took them to cross that thing? 40 years. What the hell are they doing all that time? Right? So question is, what, why, why 40 years? It's because you can't have a people. You can't form a new state. It's all about the formation of Israel. You can form a new state with anyone born in slavery. So God needs to wipe out everyone born in slavery. What? Well, they're all complaining. They're walking through the desert. They're kvetching nonstop. They're like, Jesus, they're hot. They're bored. They're tired. They're hungry. They keep, they keep inventing new gods. He keeps saying to Moses, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to kill them all. They're annoying. I'm not making this up. This is all in Exodus. <laughs> and uh, Moses is like, you can't. You can't kill them. 
You can't kill them. Like you, you made this deal with them. He says, fine, I'll kill you. And that's why Moses never gets to the homeland. He is the first Jesus. He's the first martyr because he's killed because so God doesn't have to kill all the Jews. That's my, that's, well, that's the stick I give on Passover. So the point is all Jews are nuts. I mean, all religions are idiotic and nuts. Um, <laughs> but, but they're all also as true as anything else. They're as true and just more idiotic. Yeah. So, <laughs> but they're, at their best, they're nutty and we can celebrate their nuttiness. I love it. But I mean, like the Old Testament is just as true as uh, the, Dar the Origin of Species by Darwin, right? Yeah. And then it's a question of how you choose it. Like, what's your shtick? You know, like, what's more interesting? So if I can crank up the oddity of the Old Testament, or a book I love is the Gospels, right? I love, and that's, that's like Rashomon, right? I mean, that's the most postmodern. That's the, that's the introduction of the postmodern, right? It's four versions of the same story. Uh, so I love the Gospels. You know, the Old Testament is great because it's like reading Moby Dick. It's just so fucked up and all over the place. <laughs> and then the Gospels are like this tight little weird postmodern Cubist Kurosawa film, you know. Oh, speaking of Jews, total uh, change of topic here. Uh, I recommend to everyone the Netflix series Unorthodox. Have you guys yeah, probably talked about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's really, but it's about this Hasidic sect, the Satmar sect, and Williamsburg and a woman who, who escapes from it and goes to Berlin, and it's quite remarkable. I uh, definitely recommend it. Uh, Landry, you got a question or a comment? Yeah, so I was just curious about so your kind of idea about plenum and how how people are connected in, in that way. Because um, one thing, I, I, as the previous RU Live, I, I went to China for six months and lived there. I studied the language, but one thing was like permanent to my experience there basically was the idea of I couldn't really connect with these people. Like my language skills were not good enough where I could really have deep conversations with people that I knew. And it was very basic stuff about what people did, what they liked. I couldn't really connect in that deep way. But then the real big thing for me was when I came back to my campus in Austin, I was like, the things that separate me from the people I'm walking around, like we speak the like same language, basically grew up the same way. And I realized that this whole distance I had built in my head, this artificial distance between everybody was, was you know, completely man-made, completely within my own head. And that like the idea that I could reach out and talk to someone next to me and act like, you know, we wouldn't be able to have something in between us was completely me separating myself from the world around me. So I'm curious, how does culture and languages in different groups of people work within this model? Like, yeah, that's great. Ah, yeah, that's generally my question. Yeah. Great question. Funny. I've had a very, I think a very similar experience. I, you know, I tried mm -hmm living in Europe for a while. And I, I couldn't stand the fact that I was linguistically reduced to a toddler. You know, I, I couldn't be nuanced. I couldn't make references. I couldn't be, I, I talk, as you might notice, I talk very quickly and I mumble and I refer to a lot. And I, and I couldn't do that in another language. Um, and so I found it humiliating. And I, I stopped traveling because I hated it. Um, <laughs> but you're right, I, I, you're, we, there is there are these beautiful moments of grace though where you're mm -hmm. out and i'd be out with you know the some friends of my parents my parents live there and with their kids and there'd be these moments despite no information being passed between us so much information being passed between us so i'd have these sort of glorious nights and if you came home and asked me what happened i don't even know what i could tell you i right? sort of i think think what you're saying right like there's this other layer we just said not to privilege, right? That's what I'm saying. Like if we could begin to elevate these other aspects of interpersonal communication, of communication, of knowledge. Mm. Uh, you know, well, William Burroughs argued that language is, um, is it's, it's really a rhythmic structure. It's really a rhythmic flow. And that if you just listen to the music of it, you'd be able to speak that language, mm. which is insane and hilarious. And, I don't know if true or not, but I definitely found that there were moments I'd be, I'd be out and I'd be talking to people. I, I don't even know what we're talking about, but I'm, there I am talking. My French was shit. My French is still shit. Uh, but I'd be yapping away. And I think because we were communicating on another level, gestural, you know, uh, yeah. you know, visual, palpable, like there's all kinds of other information coming at us. I and mean, just because someone doesn't speak your language doesn't mean you don't know she likes you. Right. That, right. That's the most obvious example yeah. desire you know it's interesting i'm in this class right now that's sort of studying tibetan buddhism especially the art that's produced and stuff like that and how much 
the interpretation of, uh, of British Protestant people and how they came to India and Tibet and so on, and they're studying Buddhist artifacts and Buddhist art, and they just fundamentally couldn't understand the idea of rituals and things like that because they're so, the Protestant-based knowledge was so on the text and understanding the text, they, they couldn't understand the idea of rituals and meditation and all these other things as well. And um, oh, wow. it's the same thing with like, I guess, verbal communication that maybe we have so much emphasis on verbal communication of how to understand another person that we forego and don't understand the, all the other channels that are coming into us. And we, we focus on the, the words, right? And if we don't understand the words, we can, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I was gonna... And of course, sometimes you really need to know. You know, like I, I got lost a lot in Paris. I'd stop and yeah. ask somebody where I'm going and they'd be like, huh? I don't know. <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite quick story about that is my parents live on a little tiny street called uh, La Rue de Picpus. And so I'm totally lost my first like four days there. And I'm like, I'm like, I know I'm really close, but there's like a La Rue de Picpus, but it's Peace Poos or something. And I'm like, I'm asking all kinds of people, do my best French. They look at me like I'm an idiot. They have no idea what I'm talking about because I said peak poos, not peace poos. <laughs> like, fuck the French. That's just a quick <laughs> aside. I was going to say, you said, where is Valencia Street? I know what they were talking about. Anyway. Uh, I was going to say, if, you're, uh, if you don't have access to the verbal language, maybe the nonverbal affect is more apparent to you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's, I love that. Yeah. That is yeah, a little more. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Like yeah, 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 for sure. I actually, I ended up having a fair amount of sex with a with a with a woman over there, and we we barely speak speak a fucking word of the same language, really, you know. But at some point, she got really angry at me. I knew that much, but I didn't really know why. So that there's limitations, right? That is, I, I, I'm not knocking. I'm, I don't ever want to privilege the mystical over the scientific, or affect over language. I love language. I love semiotic communication. I love. I, it's never one or the other. You know, that was always a problem I realized when I was teaching. My students would often bash this other form. Like, no, no, you missed my point. And I, that it was on me, I think, because I, I, I think I overemphasized something. To me, it's all, it's all good. You know, like, it's all information. He was mad at you because you weren't communicating with her. Yeah, no, you know what it was? Is that I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't kiss her in front of her father. Oh. Anyway. Um, and that creeped me out. But I was like, they're not even Jewish. Why are they having this weird Oedipal thing? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> All right, Jason, you're up. Yes, uh, good evening. So um, I, I just want to diverge a bit and, and talk about uh, Nietzsche for a second. Yeah, please. So I, I have a book here called Humanity by an a English philosopher. And this might be need for someone like you, this, this question, but he makes a connection between uh, Nietzsche's philosophy as being some sort of influence, even though uh, in a distance to, uh, to Nazism. So mm -hmm. someone like you that knows a lot about Nietzsche, what would you have to say about that? Uh, well, you know, the Nazis love Nietzsche, yeah. you know, and they, the soldiers, I mean, as we may know, right, they, they all got pat, they all put the spoke there, it was a book they all had to take out into the field with them. So the Nazis claimed um, Nietzsche as, uh, as theirs, right? And some of that is historical, and, and there are people who know a lot more about this than I do. His, Nietzsche's sister was married to a very prominent anti-Semite, and when Nietzsche had his collapse, he lived with her, and she controlled the his books, he had publishing rights. Uh, but Nietzsche goes out of his way throughout the books, at least it's Walter Kaufman, tr main translator's argument, that he, out of his way to distinguish why he's not anti-Semite, right? Because Nietzsche, Nietzsche, there's great lines throughout him where he's like, the only thing worse than a Jew is a, is a German, you know? Uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, I get the Nazis. The Nazis were, you know, beautiful in their sort of blanket rejection of Judeo-Christianity. You know, and they really saw in Nietzsche the possibility, right? So I don't know how many people know this, right? The, the, uh, the, the Nazis uh, made Christmas illegal. They, you know, they weren't just anti-Jewish. They were anti-Judeo-Christian, right? And they were trying to, they were really saw themselves as neoclassical. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's just a fact, right? Nietzsche, I mean, it's the same way the, the idiots online who, who you know, I, I'm going to say something I've never said aloud before, but I think it's a phrase, and you guys can correct me if it's wrong. It's something called cancel culture, or like woke culture, right? These are people, I think, who have done a terrible job of reading, let's say, uh, Derrida, 
and Foucault. I mean, certain ideas open up to other possibilities. You know, Nietzsche goes out of his way to argue against Resentiment, and nothing's more res resentful than the fucking Nazis killing the Jews, right? So there's a huge performative contradiction there for them. I see their attraction to it. Um, here's, my, here's my take, Jason, for what it's worth. The fundamental difference between the Nazis and Nietzsche, and it is, it is fundamental, I believe, at least my reading and Daniel's reading, I believe this is right for you, is that for me, he's possibly the only major canonical philosopher who I would say is truly an individualist. Mm. Yeah. Right? And the Nazis most clearly were not individualist. Right. Yeah, great point. Yeah. yeah, they're so like a resentful mob. They're the herd. They're yeah. the worst of the worst. Yeah. Nationalists par excellence. I mean, they, they perfected nationalism and obedience to this collective identity known as Germany and greater Germany, right? Nietzsche talks about the Superman, right? Who is the individual, who is you to your fullest potential. But not just your fullest potential, but you are, it's, it's the Ubermensch, it's your overcoming. You're constantly overcoming yourself as opposed to a fascist who doubles down on one ideology. Well, you're overcoming yourself and you're also, for Nietzsche, overcoming the dominant morality of your yeah. society, Yeah. right? Yeah. The genealogy of morals, right? That's one of his books. And it's, it's a deconstruction of morality. And it's saying to become a fully realized human being in all its glory, and he considers it to be glorious to be an individual human being, one must overcome, surpass the dominant ideology, the norms that constrain us, that repress us, that tell us what not to do all day long, right? So nothing is more fundamentally anti-Nazi than that. Yeah, yeah, completely, yeah. I mean, same with Derrida and Foucault, same with the postmodern, the way it's been co-opted by, I, and again, I didn't realize this till recently, and actually, I think that I was talking about this at some point, because I didn't understand this, how the word postmodern had this sort of negative connotation with a certain worldview, because to me, the postmodern was all about the proliferation of perspectives, right. and the opposite of having, any, like, the idea of identity politics and the postmodern being linked together is so bizarre to me, I don't, there's something I missed along the way. The same way, Jordan Peterson, the Nazis claiming Nietzsche. I could, I could see why they had a certain ideological value. They wanted a philosopher, like they took on Wagner, they took on certain artists that fit their worldview or something they could say is German, right? They couldn't, it's not like they could take Karl Marx, he's a Jew, right? They couldn't take, you know. And, uh, that, that complete misconception of the link between postmodernism and identity politics is the product of a symbiotic marriage between the social justice warriors on campus and this guy named Jordan Peterson. So the social justice warriors on campus are saying the things that you're saying, you are Jewish and white and a man, which means X, Y, and Z about you eternally. Uh, and I am not those things, which means these things eternally, fundamentally, essentially, and naturally, right? Bizarre. Yeah, it's really bizarre. I miss this whole phenomenon. I've heard of this guy, Peterson. I don't know who he is, but. And Jordan Peterson about three years ago, started, he made his name by saying that all that nonsense on college campuses about identity politics and about black people being a certain way and white people being a certain way and men and women being certain ways, that all comes from these evil, and he calls them evil, French philosophers, Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. That's what, what he like, calls them out by name. You need to read and, and get on the media more, Daniel. Yes, this is what George- I don't, I, when, I, when someone seems like an idiot, I just ignore them. That's, am I right, everyone? I am right. Jordan Peterson has been saying this over and over with no substance, having never read anything clearly of either one of those four, uh, authors over and over for at least three years now. And so, and then Jordan Peterson became this international phenomenon. And so this, we now have this world of millions and millions of people who believe that, that mm -hmm. Foucault and Derrida and postmodernists created this, this lunacy this stuff, I should say, on campuses that is actually essential as an anti-postmodernist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's fine. I missed that jump. That's great. That's half. I thank you for that. I, I'm so confused by it. But I think it'll happen with any any thinker at some point. It's exciting, and people will just take it on and all kinds of ways. Is Nietzsche? You know, I mean, fuck. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I there's nothing really to say there, other than that's just what happens in interpretive flows. You know, right. is that it? Does that help? Is that address your uh yes thank you uh thank you daniel also thank you thad for your uh, addition to that, yeah, that, that was, you taught me something there thad i missed that whole fucking movement here it's always confused me
You're welcome. You're very welcome. Let's move on to uh, last topic here. Uh, something else you're keenly interested in. You've just written about it. Cryptocurrency, blockchain, and the future of the world economy, for God's sake. Yeah. Big, you're making some big claims or you have a lot of hope. You see a lot of opportunity. A lot of opportunity, yeah. I mean, the thing that, the thing that I've been taught in the past couple of years is I got it through through a client um, and I had to really extend my mind was this idea of, um, and especially going against a lot of my own instincts, which will probably rub a lot of you the wrong way, but I definitely grew up sort of a socialist communist um, and realizing how much those are industrial side and how much there's a, association between um, what we call what people we call trickle down supply side economics and socialism right the idea is if you fund the powers that be it will trickle down and whether that's big corporations or whether that's state institutions um, I realize it's the same model and it all is premised on a monopoly around money um, and one thing that really excites me about crypto is 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 competitive currencies and the idea of being part of a, a, a currency a flow an economy of money that's tied to an economy of value, an economy of worth, an economy of belief, an economy of, 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 you know, we call it brand or something. It's, it, I, I believe in that currency. And so I think so many of the models we have right now of um, economics, of, of, of especially this, I just wrote this piece on, uh, on, on trying to imagine a post-corona world, and so many of our models are still premised on industrial age economic models, which involve massive um, uh, 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 centralizations of capital, right? If you want to start a factory, right? You need massive centralization, right? Of a lot of capital. If I want to launch a digital product. I don't need really fucking much at all, right? There's almost zero margin, marginal costs. Um, all those models, right, of this industrial age are all premised again on, on top-down economics, right? Hierarchical, um, centralization of capital and power, um, and then on um, a fundamentally a scarcity model because the industrial model is fueled by petrol, right? Fueled by oil, which is scarce. So there's these battles around that's gonna drive up value. But in an information economy, it's infinitely abundant. And information has passed uh, oil as the most uh, valuable asset in the world, right? The biggest companies in the world now are Apple and Google and Facebook and Fang, right? It's not Exxon Mobil anymore. Um, and we need economic tools and, and economic models that map to an information economy, not an industrial economy. So it comes to me back to Marshall McLuhan. You know, people read, you know, Medium is a Massage or Andy McLuhan who argues that the, a lot of our problems culturally are we're using the wrong models. We're using antiquated models to make sense of contemporary situations. We're using railroads to make sense of electronic, what he calls electronic communication. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, uh, yeah, so concretely here, uh, so people understand this, or at least so I can understand this. Um, so the Federal Reserve Bank over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years has essentially printed, created, invented yeah. trillions of dollars of fiat currency, right? Yeah. And then given it to whom? banks right yeah, so, yeah. But, so that's the centralized economic model yeah, yeah we have we have so i it's, it's a funny world i live in because i i used to critique capitalism we don't have capitalism in this country right we have socialism for corporations and it's a very strange thing that's that's happened um and one thing i had to learn recently when i was actually first time in my life i had to do research i couldn't just talk out my own ass um is that uh it's not just the the central bank which can print money but it's commercial banks and this actually, if anyone gives a shit, is kind of interesting in that commercial, the amount of, of um, credit a commercial bank needs to have in its bank, in it, uh, the reserves they need to have in order to issue credit under Bill Clinton got reduced to near nil. So they could just issue credit mm -hmm. to big corporations. So that's literally making money out of nothing. You don't even need the central printing press anymore, right? They just create, just use money. You have credit. Credit is such a bizarre concept at that point, um, and it's all been. And because of you know, I try, try to argue. Uh, in the last, I was trying to figure out what changed so much since I was a kid, and I realize it's it's pretty obvious, right? It began with Reagan, and it was continued. We look at Reagan and then Clinton as a disparity, um, but they were. It's it's a continuous model of what's called neoliberalism, right? Of of the 
the whole formation of the of the state to serve corporate interests. And so you have certain things that got passed, like Citizens United and whatever the other speechnow.org, whatever the fuck it is, that allowed corporations, the, the, the creation of super PACs. So all of a sudden you have politicians who are explicitly, legally, ex there's no hiding, there's no corruption. They just made it legal to have their seat and their vote bought. And that was the big change. That's why something like the Great Society or FDR, even if you wanted it, couldn't happen anymore. Right, so even if you wanted the centralization of capital, which again doesn't, I don't think makes any sense anymore. Um, corporations beginning with Ronald Reagan and then really spearheaded by Bill Clinton um, took control of uh, the Federal Reserve and took control of the banking industry. Right. Uh, served big banking interests. And now we face this clusterfuck, which is there's no one's incentivized to help us. Right. If he lives in a free market, of course, there's an incentive to help people, right? Those are your customers. Right. But when your company can go belly up and just have the bank print money for you, right. there's no incentive. It's, a, it's, a, it's bad systems architecture. And crypto changes all that because it makes your, your currency accountable. Competitive currencies now become accountable. Yep. Wow. So the Fed prints all this money, gives it out. People give it away, free credit. That creates bubbles like housing famously in 2006 and seven. Like in higher education, everybody right now, which might be the biggest bubble we have. And then what happens to bubbles? They pop. And we have many bubbles in the economy that preceded the pandemic, by the way, that a lot of people were predicting were about to pop. And have you seen what, by the way, is, have you all seen what's happened to higher education in recent weeks? Do you see that Stanford, Stanford University, which is not just the wealthiest university, it's probably one of the wealthiest institutions in the history of the world, is in a financial crisis now and is letting off people and is a hiring freeze and it has there's pay cuts in the administration at Stanford I mean so so once I'm, I thought you were gonna say you know these bubbles are gonna create an economic collapse I guess you were saying this well, but I don't know about that because that gets super complicated I don't know I don't know enough about economic theory so well, I think I, will, I, I'm pretty sure there will be at least some bubbles popping and I hope at least one of them will be higher education but whatever you know significant chunks of the high, of the economy will collapse or, or contract severely, pretty clearly, regardless of the pandemic shutdown. And that presents, I thought you were going here, a tremendous opportunity for cryptocurrency, right? Yeah, to, for a new, yeah, for a new model, right? So from below, from below, right? A new way of exchanging services, information, and goods, right? That, I think it's about competitive currencies. I think yeah. it's about saying we don't not tether to any particular currency anymore and different models of distribution right so there's all kinds of ways i don't know how, i don't know how much people know about crypto at this point or not um but the idea is you can create a currency and, a, and a, the network and it's called um you, the rules of that network and the production of that currency and the way value and inflation are controlled are all transparent you opt in or you opt out you buy that currency or you don't and when you own that currency, you are now a member of that network, literally, physically, you're, it, cause it's decentralized. You're, you're, I mean, you don't technically actually need to have your computer be part of it, uh, but you can. And unlike, uh, let's say Google, which has all their servers centralized, right? And everything streams from the top down, it's a hierarchical model. While information is decentralized, the economic tools are still centralized and the information is still centralized. Everything goes back to one thing decentralization, it means there are not big stacks of servers. So one of the things from, I think that would excite you, Thad, right, is, and I've talked to my team a lot about, is developing things that got shut down, um, like Craigslist sex ads and uh, a back page and red book, things that got aggressively shut down when the government just come in and seize your servers, right? In, decentral, in a decentralized network, there's no one to fucking arrest. It's out there, the algorithm is just running, it runs, as long as there's one computer still running it, it doesn't matter. Right. There's no thing to seize, right? right? So it opens up a, a relationship between capital and, and freedom that is so fucking interesting to me. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, I've abandoned my socialist ways for, I call myself now crypto anarchist, like nice. just a fundamentally different model of how we can take care of each other and generate value. And um, I know you've been talking a lot about I've noticed us on the Twitter about mutual aid. Like, let's take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Of the government, I don't need you to tell me to stay inside. I'm going to stay inside. I'm going to, I'll go outside to help people. Right? 
Fortunately, we don't do that because we still think of the parent, right? So we think if the parents not looking, I can do what I want. So if we really got rid of that and had an anarchist or government, an anarchist regime, lack of regime, it would, I think would inaugurate different kinds of behaviors. You want to talk about so fucking interesting for this. Yes, do you want to talk about Anasa, the people you're working with? Hey, the company I'm doing, yeah. So our model is, um, is to actually let anybody, there's two things we're doing. One thing is to create um, any community, any group that wants to create what's called, you know, vertically integrated system, meaning um, a full network of people who support it, a token, and then an application layer, right? An application layer being social media, Facebook, you know, a, a version of Facebook, you know, any social media, any content sharing, including all your financial uh, needs, um, but connected to your own token, connected to your own network. So we're creating a platform that lets anyone develop them. And then we're develop, we're launching our own that a lot that is that is fundamentally regenerative, in which all capital generated is returned. There's no profit accumulation. So the present model based on um, petrol is about extraction. Let's take, let's take, let's take, right? The common, the capitalist mode, right? Is everything is about how much value can I extract? and accumulate up at top. But in the, in the, in the crypto, it, at its best, in the model we're pursuing is that we don't have users or customers. You have members, you have participants. Everybody shares equally in, in, in capital accumulation, right? And all value that's generated on the network for all the various things you might pay for are returned immediately to everybody in the network. Right, so it's, a, it's rather than scarcity, it's abundance. It's just constant mutual sharing um, rather than capital centralization. Right. So we are gonna, Landry's gonna post your medium piece that you were just talking about, right? right. And uh, Anatha, you, should we put Anatha's, um, what's Yeah, the that? website, we know it's super big right now. It's, it's not live, so it's, I'm in charge of that. What it says there, and it's super esoteric, um, it's just because on purpose, because uh, which you might or might not know is there's a war between the SEC and crypto, um, and they just came down with a very severe ruling um, against a company called Telegram, which has been decentralized messaging. Oh my God! Really? Yeah, I got ruled. Their release of their token was just ruled a security, and they're being fined. And oh no! Um, so you, you we have to be super careful in what we say and all this crap until everything's legally vetted and. There's only certain things we can say. So the website's not that helpful, to be honest. It's more helpful if you read the medium pieces. Um, and there's a, it's, it's not because we're shitty communicators. It's for a reason. That okay. So everyone, the link, bit constructed that the link to uh, Daniel's article on Medium is in the chat. Landry just posted it recently. See that? Good piece. I recommend the but I, Not everything I write, I recommend. That's a good one. Uh, right. I'll actually have to do some research. I recommend it too. All right. Running out of time here. We're going to go to the private session in a second. Let's see. Oh, we have a few hands here. Who has not spoken? I guess you all have. Um, let's go. Oh, Ken, actually, you've been waiting for a while. Yeah, um, this is kind of getting back to something we were talking about quite a while ago. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating topic um, that the, the kind of in our uh, modern day, we're kind of um, conditioned to think of religion and, uh, and science or rationalism as like fundamentally opposed. Um, and it's super interesting how, um, you know, back, you know, several hundred years ago, um, there were actually a ton of uh, people who were kind of early scientists and also mystics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, you know, some uh, topic that's interested me for a while now. Um, I have a list of a few of the more well-known ones. Uh, Pythagoras, um, any of you who have taken geometry would know Pythagoras. Uh, Francois uh, Rabelais, uh, Giordano Bruno. Uh, the scientist? Uh, uh, Bruno or Rabelais? Rabelais. Uh, Rabelais, uh, less of a scientist, uh, definitely more of a mystic, but uh, definitely like kind of got kicked out of the church and uh, was into kind of, you know, some uh, underground ideas that uh, were, were, you know, back then, you know, again, mysticism and science were sort of the same thing. So he was kind of crossed back and forth. He's mainly a writer, um, but definitely Giordano Bruno, who was, um, I think, around the same time period, um, was, you know, advocating the Copernican model of, uh, you know, heliocentrism. Um, got burned at stake for it by the Inquisition. Um, and uh, he was actually the first guy to like publicly put out the, this theory that uh, not only that does the earth go around the sun, but also all those stars out there, those are actually other suns that are really, really far away. 
Wow. He foresaw this with literally zero evidence. He didn't have a telescope that was powerful enough to see stars. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Roger Bacon, another guy who was a mystic, definitely an empiricist. Um, John Dee, who uh, was uh, Queen Elizabeth I's uh, court astrologer, um, kind of coined the term the British Empire um, Mm -hmm. and sort of, um, you know, kind of got a lot of stuff going. Uh, Newton, um, as uh, many of you probably already know. Um, Nietzsche uh, definitely had some kind of kind of quasi mystical aspects to him because he um, he I loved that he like uh, you know was so fundamentally opposed to Judeo uh, Christian Christian you know morality, but also um, that he kind of wanted to replace man in um, the spot that had been reserved for God. You know, <laughs> that God is man right. essentially, right. and uh, in a sense, like you know, you can think of like every every god and you know, a history of all religions is, you know, kind of came from some person's, you know, personal experience. And it's a, uh, it's definitely, um, you know, when you think about it in that, in that way, it's like, you know, they're all just kind of you know, projections um, of, you know, human archetypes. And uh, one, a couple of guys that uh, I wanted to talk about the most, I'm familiar uh, with pretty well, um, Jack Parsons, uh, there's a show about him, um, he uh, was an early rocket scientist whose like dream was like get to the moon, and he was like doing rocket science in the 30s. But he was also like kind of a satanist, kind of like into the uh, like that, like sex magic, all this weird shit. Uh, but, um, love it. Okay, Jack Parsons, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, he you know was just like you know doing rocket science, and he was actually outside of the academy. He was trying to um, be like you know fundamentally uh, trained in in like what early rocketry. Um, but you know, he tried to join, I think it was like the university of UC LA or something like that. Um, and they wouldn't let him in because he wasn't like, um, you know, like one of the good old boys essentially. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll Reich is the great, is another one in that, uh, that we'll have Reich. Oh yeah. Reich. Yeah. Reich. You know, it's super interesting. Um, and then, uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Alistair Crowley, um, you know, definitely kind of a, you know, out there guy, but he had a, an interesting saying that his whole thing his whole philosophy was uh the method of science and the aim of religion that uh he wanted to apply the scientific method of empiricism not just of the quantitative but also the qualitative and uh and yeah i didn't know that oh, that's great yeah yeah um and he wanted to kind of you know take that method and then just direct it towards you know the mystical goal and um yeah. and so it's yeah there's a lot of stuff out there that um kind of you know goes against the the grain of you know religion versus a science and it's uh so it's all kind of you know something that fascinates me deeply and uh, i don't think that uh, mysticism necessarily has to be um kind of essentialist uh in in you know fad terms i know like i really kind of hate the way that like you know astrology and a lot of like palm reading and shit like that works is it like they're like are predicting your future they're making all kinds of truth claims but i don't think it necessarily has to be that way um, so it's right. definitely uh yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of stuff out there. Many people are not very well aware of. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. I'm gonna look up this. I'm into this Parsons guy in Crowley. I gotta look that up. There's yeah. a show um, that is all about Jack Parsons' life. I think it's on CBS called Strange Angel. Good show. <laughs> Great name. I'm not fictionalized, but lots of good stuff. There. Thank you. All right, Tom. You still have a question? No, that was it. Oh yeah. No, I, I, I definitely. Um, so yeah, uh, I I guess uh, my my question being that um, no, that was actually sorry. I was <laughs> we got to move on. Sorry. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Tom, I was calling on Tom. He's had his hand up for a while. Tom, go ahead. Got to unmute. Is there another Tom? Or are you talking to me? I'm talking to you. Uh, I just accidentally left my hand up. Though. I don't have any more. Oh, you're good. Okay. So uh, Landry, you're the last one then. Yeah, I was just going to touch on a, one quick note was that, um, and then I'll get to that question, uh, about the idea. I had this art history professor, and she's sort of well-known as, or she, her name's Dr. Linda Harrison, uh, Henderson, and she talks about the idea of, like, fourth dimension and the occult and really early modern art, and how sort of it's not really well understood, especially now when the fourth dimension became the Einstein, Einsteinian model, that time was the fourth dimension. But the whole, there's this whole lineage of people that were very interested in the idea of a fourth dimension of space and how a spiritual realm, like, but it had this weird blending of science as well as spiritual. And the early 20th century was so interested in this esoteric uh, idea of fourth, the fourth dimension. And so many artists like Duchamp, most famously, and his um, 
Uh, he has this famous uh, glass sculpture that's not even a painting. He wanted to create this like idea of art outside of painting, and it's, it's very fascinating. Yeah, it's um, Philadelphia. Yes, from Philadelphia. Yeah, and he, there's one famous story about how on the road it was going to go to Connecticut for some lady who bought one of it, and it cracked. And he actually like liked the idea that it cracked because he had this old idea of how things are random, and if you you know, all this idea about probability and I he's really, yeah, right? right? Yeah, he's a, Duchamp is like a, I mean, he's was so ahead of his time that he's just a fascinating figure. Um, but I guess my question was how, how, what was your personal evolution and how did you get to crypto and where you are now? And like, right. you're changing up ideas, like from a personal basis, how did you get open up to that? One thing I've noticed, so, so I, I, you know, I, I, I you know, I got excited by philosophy and Foucault and Derrida very early, and 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 I was always, you know, I went, I was in the rhetoric program at UC Berkeley, where all my a lot of my pe people studying with. While I was there, um, a professor came to the department and ruined everything, uh, named Judith Butler, and it was the rise of like identity politics, and she she really spearheaded that in my department, and it was sort of horrific. But there were a lot of people studying like material critique. And I was like, fuck all that. I just want to like talk about affect and flow. And I had a, I taught a class called Joyful Complexity, which is in fact the name of my company. Um, but I, it came out of these classes I was teaching on joy and complexity and emergent theories of emergence. And then I, and then I, I, I got married, had a kid, and the dot com thing happened. And next thing I knew, I got super wrapped up in just the conditions of having to make a living. And I stumbled on, in a way, Marxism, which I read when I was a kid, because I grew up as a little red diaper baby, but I hadn't really thought about and really learned from the inside out how the demands of capital can subjugate you. Um, and I became this kind of, not say a Marxist per se, but, a, but a, a, a critique of, I became a critic of capitalism. And then really was, and then the crypto thing happened just through a client of mine. Um, and I didn't understand a word he was saying to me. You know, a friend of mine was connected to him and the guy kept calling me up every day and he's super smart on shit. And I was like, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand economic theory. I don't understand what you're saying to me. And then it flipped and it blew my mind wide open. But it really wasn't until, I mean, I've understood it conceptually, the idea of an information age economy versus industrial economy. But it really wasn't until this latest clusterfuck that I understood the power of a monopoly on money. Uh, when these guys can release money and control where it goes. I'm like, whoa, uh, whoa, like then we're supposed to have democracy, but we don't. So, I, and all of a sudden I got interested in competitive currencies. And all of a sudden this whole other aspect of crypto that I've always been able to voice, but never really deeply understood. I now deeply understand. I'm like, whoa, mm. I don't want to be tethered to the US dollar. I can't believe these motherfuckers. I don't even get a $1,200 check because I made too much money. And imagine a $1,200 check in San Francisco. You gotta be kidding me, that pays for my dinner. You know, yeah. I, it, it's, it's it, and I know you can say, well, fuck, get out of San Francisco, but no, I can't, I have a son here, so I'm fucked. Um, I, to be at the mercy of these people. So for me, it was very organic. Um, okay. Rise of my sort of political consciousness. You know, I began as a young kid with a, uh, you know, my grandfather was a, was a, lawyer for the communist party um and my father was indicted by the government and tried by the government we had fbi agents in our house and all that kind of crap uh, so i grew up thinking i was a communist and i think that is and i share this a lot and then realizing it, it begins to just become liberalism and liberalism is the death of everything that's good in this world um and you know Okay. I came by it all very honestly, to be honest, and I, I just it all came to me from the inside out, like from my conditions. Got it. So do you think that like sort of just how like I guess politics is downstream from culture, so on, that like eventually we'll have as Marxism, capitalism, and sort of the models of governance we have now are very much rooted in Enlightenment and industrial era thinking exactly. that we'll have sort of brand new ways of thinking about governance, sort of the idea of how we interact as individuals with each other that crypto will be a part of, you know, yeah, more no so than just monetarily? Crypto will, no question, be a part. The question is what, how it gets played out. And the government is not going to go down easy, not going to relinquish control. And the downside of crypto, the upside of crypto is this immediate, immediate tracking of peer-to-peer -peer negotiations. 
and the ability to, to uh, get paid right on the spot, right? I mean, that's an incredible thing. If anyone, anyone freelance here, I mean, you ever try to get paid? It's unbelievable, the number of parties involved in getting paid. I get paid by bank, there's at least six people involved. I'm talking to my client, they write a check to their bank, they send it through bill.com, it goes through another bank, it gets vetted by Visa. I mean, it's like six parties involved, all taking a little piece by the time it comes. Yeah. My, uh, Super exciting that way, you know? My cousin, he works in crypto and he's just starting to use this one crypto company that basically it pays you as you work, basically. Instead yeah. of waiting for a weekly paycheck, you're getting your money as you're making it, which is, it, 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 that changes so much about the liquidity of capital, how capital can flow, who takes parts of it and who takes control of it. It, it, it changes everything. It, it seems pretty simple at first. And then you're like, whoa, whoa. Like I, the downside of that, I think, or the risk of that is a kind of micro fascism. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I recently read, you know, uh, PK Dick's Ubik, you know, and the fact that every moment is monetized of your life, you know, every motherfucker, when you want to go to the bathroom, you want to play on the park, you want to, every moment can be micro monetized. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, I, beautiful technology getting in the hands of an armed state generally doesn't turn out that well for any of us, but I, in the meantime, I like the idea and I'm going to push for it. So what do you think about like Facebook and other parties and governments kind of getting into crypto? Like, what do you think of those spaces and people trying to get into them? Yeah, I mean, the Facebook Libra and all that is super interesting. You know, at their best, I think that the upside to it is that they'll, you know, I, I haven't read the white paper in depth. Uh, people on my team have, and they're like, well, you know, it's still mostly a centralized. The idea is that they're centralized and be, begin to move towards decentralized. Um, so they basically just want to function as a bank and they want to supplant the government. And I respect that, but they're fuck them and fuck the fact that they're a corporation, which only exists because of the government. Yeah. That's cool. I don't understand how capitalism and corporations can coexist. That's socialism. I don't understand. Um, it shouldn't be corporations. It's a tax status. Right. Um, but I think hope the idea, our hope, at least on my team who know more than I do, is that Facebook and their Libra will lead the way and 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 do fight a lot of the battles with the SEC. Okay. Uh, that will hopefully allow. Well, the beautiful thing about crypto is at some point once it's deployed, there's not a whole much a whole lot you can do, right? Yeah. It's, it's really like becomes like the matrix. Like you're constantly trying to like whack a ball. Like it's constantly going to pop up everywhere. And it's only it's very you can't just shut it down from a centralized site. Um, that was so, my great. I don't know enough about how it's all going to play out. I'm right. still relatively new to materialist critique. You know? Yeah. That was my favorite thing about Cody Wilson and how like, you know, he, his thing is more guns and uh, basically putting guns on decentralized servers and stuff like that. And then how you just gun control can't exist in that world. You know, he, he, he didn't care about giving money to the NRA to fight these policies. He created a world that they can't operate it anymore. You can't shut down guns, you know, it's, it's I mean, a I'm fascinating not, way of politics. I'm a fan of a lot of guns. You know, I'm a nice Jewish yeah. guy. Um, I am a fan of whores and I'm a, and I'm a fan of direct payment without the fucking banks. And I'm a fan of not being a customer or being a participant in a network. And that's to me is the most exciting thing for anyone who gives a shit. One of the most interesting things is in crypto is something called the DAO, which is the decentralized autonomous organization. So it's a different fundamental, different structure than a corporation, right? It's not a whole bunch of people. It's decentralized and it's autonomous. It just runs itself. It runs itself. And the terms of how value is extracted and shared is pre-written into the, into the contract, right? So you can't have, it's not like Facebook that's constantly extracting. They're just grabbing dollars from their ads every chance they get. Um, you participate in a network and that's the company. Like there's, no, there's no corporate officers. Right. It's incredible, right? Once it's deployed, it's deployed. And then the community decides what, if you want, in a, it doesn't need to be this way. It can be centralized, but in the best version of it, you decide together how things work. You all participate. You're kind of, it, it eliminates the stock market. You're a shareholder and a user at all at the same time. And yeah. it's, it shifts the whole distribution architecture of, of money. All right, Ben, you really do get the very last question and then we're going to move to the private over time. So. Yeah, look, just to, uh, Brief uh, comment really on the crypto business. Um, Daniel, are you aware of the uh, 
the argument or the explanation that it was actually villagers in Africa who invented cryptocurrency. Have you heard this? I want to know. That sounds awesome. So I, I don't know the story in enough detail to make for scintillating YouTube viewing, but the outline is like this. Um, a very good friend of mine uh, opened a, a crypto brokerage a few years ago. And so this is part of how he explains crypto to, to various audiences. It was that with in a, a country in Central Africa where, you know, inflation was, was, was crazy, the fiat currency in that country was, was essentially worthless. And then with the invention or the introduction of widespread uh, mobile phone technology, the currency became telephone minutes or credit phone, minute phone credits. Uh, so people wouldn't actually use them to make calls, but they would buy and sell uh, produce services, whatever it was in a number of, uh, in, in the number of phone credits, they could just pass to each other. They could sort of text them to each other. So it was a completely, um, seamless, zero friction, you know, complete trust. And it's, that's to me is the best practical example of how the hell the witchcraft uh, of crypto yeah. works. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, it's all this fungibility stuff, right? So we had it with you know, airline miles. Are they fungible, not fungible? Can I share them? Can I not share them? Right? Like what are these other currencies? Uh, 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 what are they called? You know, coins from a, from a uh, casino. What are they called? The chips, right? They're fungible, right? And they're untethered from the capital, right? They can be worth, a $5 chip doesn't need to be worth $5, right? It, will, it could have its own currency. Um, a lot of sex chat stuff works through tokens, right? These sort of fungible is a word I never knew before. Um, <laughs> but it's fucking fantastic. It's a great word. It's fun just to say, right? It just means it's exchange of the same thing. One dollar is worth another dollar. Unlike a painting of Picasso versus a painting of Matisse. They're one of a kind, right? They're not fungible. Mm -hmm. And you can make non-fungible tokens too, which actually is super interesting because it inaugurates like um, the uh, uh, control for artists over their um, their assets. So now rather than Spotify, fuck Spotify, right? Fuck decentralized models. I can create a song that act functions as a token, as a smart contract that's non-fungible. And when you download and listen to it, there's a smart contract built into it that you would agree to that you pass value back to me as the creator. Right. And I don't, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to have lawyers. I don't have to go through Spotify to protect me. It's just the, it's a way for people to protect their IP. Um, unlike Facebook, which just steals their IP and makes money on it. All right, cool. Now, thank you. We are about to move to the private overtime session when we all get, get dirty. We all, this is, this is the moment when we all get to, cry. yeah, we get to, we get to use bad words and stuff, you know, and unlike dirty curse. Sorry about that. discourse we've been engaging in so far. If you are watching this video on YouTube and you're not a member of Renegade University and you would like to participate in the next RU Live, go to renegadeuniversity.com or click the link in the description below. All right, guys, we're going to go private. Hold on. <laughs>